today I'm talking about micro front ends, the good parts, the bad, and also the ugly parts. And my goal for this talk is not to convince you that micro friends are super cool and then you shit and you shouldn't do anything else out there. But my goal is to show you that it's possible and to tell you about all of the pains I had with that because I'm working on a project for one year now with micro front ends and I learned, learned a lot of things today uh, in this year and I just wanted to tell you about so you don't have to make the same mistakes as I did. And um, I'm Vanessa. I like Vue and I also like Svelte. I do weightlifting and I do like to ferment some food. You can find me online as Wanzel or Wenzel if you prefer that. And yeah, this was the wine thing Anton was um, spoiling about. We have a wine podcast. It's called Ausbaufähig. And if you know alone at home and don't know what to do. We try to have weekly episodes right now and taste some random wines. If you have a hard time being at home alone right now, maybe I would not advise you to drink alcohol, but you can listen to me do that. And you can find the slides in the speaker channel. Um, Vanessa Bühner, yes with an Ö. And now, brief. And please think of an online shop right now. So what's going on in an online shop? We have a landing page and on this landing page you usually have explanations or just think of yourself as the user right now. So you come to this landing page of the online shop and the landing page is providing you some explanation. What is this page about? This is about um, clothes or shoes or like um, bigger retails and just everything and if you're convinced that this is a secure and good shop you can go to some product categories where you see different products of different manufacturers and you can also learn about maybe some combinations and set of different things maybe it gets cheaper if you buy combinations of different products if you want to know more about one single product, you go to the detail page or similar, where you can see which colors are available, what are the sizes, are there price differences, are these products right now available, and so on and so forth. If everything is good, um, you land in the cart and... Oops. And... Nowadays, we also have a more modern approach like conversational flow. So you have a chatbot flow and there's just going on a lot of stuff because we have to communicate with you as a user. And if we have a good way to convince you that our products and also our shop is good, then you might um, provide um, information for us in the checkout process. You give us your address, you give us some payment information and as soon as you're done in the checkout we give you an, a successful confirmation that you actually bought the correct things that you wanted to buy. And after that you might want to check what's going on in your order. So you want to see a history and you want to track your shipments. So you have an account area. So what I want to show you here, you have a lot of things, different things going on in an online shop. And while in the single products here, you as a user don't need to change or you can't change anything. So you can't say, okay, I want to have the shoes in blue. I write like blue in the database. That's not possible. But here in the checkout area, you have to um, add a lot of your information and might want to change this information quickly. So what you need um, are like different databases, different microservices. And I worked for different online shops in my life already and different states of code bases. And a lot of these online shops were built like 10 years ago. And this is a thing we call like spaghetti legacy code. And when you start there as a new front end developer and you're totally hyped, yeah, you're starting a new job and then you come to this and you see this big box of 10 year old code. And so you're, yeah, thanks, I guess, because you're super afraid to touch any code any CSS class or whatever because maybe you change the padding on the landing page and by accident the checkout just um, breaks. 
So the goal for a lot of online shops out there right now, the ones which are maybe five to 15 years old, the goal for most of them is right now to create something scalable. And so I was working on a project like Rewrite It Please. And so we had a look at the different architectures that were out there. So there's something I call the real monolith. Um, so you have something like a, a team where front end and back end engineers are combined and you have like completely server side rendered pages and pass on data via window objects and um, communicate maybe via get parameter. Afterwards, we split the front end and the back end. So we had a team front end with designers and also a team back end and DevOps. And the communication was done with HTTP, REST, SOAP. And afterwards, um, I already mentioned that you have different things to do with different databases. So you might need a service for the product information, a service for the card, a service for the checkout, and a service then afterwards again for your account. So a few years ago, microservices were like the next big thing. And so the front end doesn't need to know the single um, different JSONs in the back end, we have something like an aggregation layer and this handles how the front end communicates with the back end services. And uh, yeah, the next logical step might just be to have a front end integration for verticalized systems. And because no one can spell that out twice, uh, we just call that micro front ends. And with micro front ends, and BFFs, so the back end for the front end, some micro front services, you have then verticals. In these verticals, you can now have these so-called cross-functional teams. So you have designers, front ends, and back end in these teams. And the great thing is that you have one mission per team. So we have like a team inspire, where for the landing page, A, B test, different explanation, pages, you have a team acquisition for product information, detail products, the chatbot flows, and then the team purchase who makes sure that the checkout, and this is important, if the checkout is not working, I'm not buying stuff at the store. Even if I looked at it for two hours and decided after two hours, I won't proceed the, if the checkout isn't good. And so you have the team purchase. Uh, so you have your autonomous teams, another cool buzzword and where you can focus on your mission what to do because it is really complicated if you have on one day to fix something on the landing page on the next day you should add a new input field in the checkout and also on the next day you should again work on a different projects these mental context switches are complicated and what you want are teams who focus on their small project in the whole project or product and to really generate ideas and focus on that. One benefit of now having micro front ends if you want to use them. You have libraries in each single one of these micro front ends, like for us, it's Vue.js. And I think um, it's a big topic always to upgrade your whole code base to your new version. Vue 3 is coming out in the future. And I heard a lot of, of people are afraid to do this whole step because does this mean we have to do a code freeze? You can't tell your project owner that this is a code freeze. It's no way you can't do a code freeze. Um, so you try to it, um, iteratively update it, upgrade it. It's complicated. But if you have micro front ends, you can just do it one micro front end per micro front end. Yes, this means that you might have two view versions in the browser loaded. This is true, um, but we are just talking about different trade-offs here. And in the end, in my opinion, it's better to um, upgrade in a time of two months uh, instead of not upgrading at all. What you also have are independent deployments. So here are three micro frontends. I color coded them. And here is our website with our three micro frontends. Uh, I know, don't know your experience all of you had in the past, but I had this experience quite often that the master is not deployable. This should never happen. It seems like to always happen that the master is not in a deployable state. Um, but if you have like 
micro front end, that means you have different repositories, different CIs, different um, rollback possibilities for each one of these micro front ends. So if you want to de deploy here the blue micro front end, the, um, and if the yellow micro front end is broken, you don't care. You can't, you just can't ship the, you, you can ship the blue micro front end without having to care about the yellow one. Um, the last times I gave this talks, I had these slides here to uh, talk about another benefit of micro front ends, and these would be decoupled code. And I had great animations here with great errors that want to explain you what if you uh, yeah, did something wrong here in the front that other dependent um, components might be affected. And then I wanted to say that, yeah, in micro front ends, this isn't the case anymore. You just break one other micro front end too if you do something wrong. But in the last couple of days, these images were like all over my Twitter account and Twitter bubble. And I think this is also a great picture to um, see how if you have a deeply coupled monolith, the problem, if you have one problem, that it's kind of running and spreading through the whole application. And with microphones, you have the clear cut. So it can't jump over. One bug can't just simply uh, hop over to another repository that isn't happening. Okay, these were the benefits. And now I want to talk about how to implement microfront and because I think there's still a lot of fear out there how to do this. There are Free. Nowadays, I think even more open source projects about how to do micro frontends and like there are frameworks out there. There's a project Mosaic of Zalando. There's something else called Podium. But if you start with it, I might um, say start or think in custom solutions because they are easier to understand and not so complex. And a custom solution would be a container application with just good old iframes. I know we are all afraid of them for good reasons. You, I mean, the height is impossible to change, but they are great to explain the, I mean, iframes are the, like the micro of 1990. You can have the same concept in JavaScript bundles or also with web, com web components, which will be accessible in the future soon, I hope. Um, so, oh, you always have a container applications when container application when having micro front end. So here are our, our three front ends, and I have here my container application. But how to ship that now to the browser? One possibility would be to have one bundle you build once at build time and ship it to the browser as one app.js. There's one crucial problem here. You can do this, but it's again nested. And if the yellow uh, micro front is not deployable, all of them are kind of not deployable. And you have to configure a lot of Webpack. And as long as you're not Bela or Johannes, it's hard. So let's forget about this one again. Um, what else can we do? We can do the iframe solution. Here in the screen, we see three micro front ends, but because my slide is like limited in the height, I want to focus now on having like one micro front end on one page on one URL. And the code for this looks like this. So we have an HTML body here. And here we have an iframe with the ID micro front end except this just an H1 with some layouting things going on. We have a script and here we have a dictionary containing the keys as um, the routes of the URL. And we have values for the endpoints where the micro front end is hosted. And what we do now is to get the iframe doc uh, element from the DOM and set the source to the key of the window location path name. And in the end, that's it. So the iframe thing here should make it easy to understand how micro front end should work because this is already a lot of the magic that is going on here. All right. So I had to learn micro front ends for like two or three months until I fully understand them. And it took me eight months to fully understand the project Mosaic. That's uh, open source from Salando. 
and we are using that at work. And I'm very sorry that we don't have eight months now. So I try to explain it in 10 minutes. And I try to explain it three times. So if you want to grab a coffee now, you have two more possibilities to let me explain it to you. The project Mosaic, um, from bottom to top right now, we have down, we have microservice and databases, Kafka, whatever. And then you have different teams, like a Team Sword and Team Shield, and they are working on HTML fragments. I will say from now on the word fragment and not micro fronted anymore because Mosaic is uh, calling them fragments. Now the question is how to combine the different um, fragments on one page. So one fragment could be a search bar, one fragment could be the card icon, whatever, and how to combine them. So we need this container application again. And this container application is the layout service and this layout service creates templates with different fragments on that page. And so how to get to these templates with these fragments, you have a router. So you have static routes, which are pointing to templates and the templates now, which fragment should be on which page. So this was the first explanation. Second one from top to bottom. You as a user, you come from the internet and I'm pretty sure you have gone through some cloud services and now you meet the skipper. This is the router. Um, and the skipper now knows, okay, you are on the landing page. So you need the template for the landing page from the layout service. And the layout service is called Taylor. On German, that means, I forgot what that means, um, zusammennehmen, some, something like this. So it makes sense. So you combine your fragments on one page. These are the fragments. And so how do these fragments then like look the same? We also have a UI component library that we are using for all of the utils, uh, buttons, input fields, forms, but also we do have quite big components in the component library, like whole products uh, containing headlines, product image, detailed stuff um, in the component library. And we are using these utils in the fragments. So the fragments are quite logic components. Now comes the third time. So the layout and fragment service. The layout service Taylor points to a template containing the free fragments, the free micro front ends. Now we want to look at the code. This could be the code. So we have an, this, this looks very similar to normal HTML. We have a head and here we have the fragment parts of it. So if we want to load fonts, icons, whatever resources, we can load the fragment and point to a source. And this is basically like an iframe tag. It's the same syntax, it's just fragment instead of iframe. And now we want to have like a header and a footer. And we might also need a product um, information like daily overview or visited. Here it's a bit more um, visible to see. So we have our like a mobile page with the fragment layout and a fragment like product daily look, products overview, products visited, and the fragments for a layout footer. And it's easily um, done in the Taylor service, the layout service, to rearrange it in a grid with CSS in the layout service. So the fragments themselves don't have to position themselves. They just have to be kind of responsive. So it's very cool that you have, can have like completely different desktop and mobile um, arrangements of your microphones if you need those. If you want to communicate between different microphones uh, a few times, you need, might need that. You can use a client side event bus, um, new custom event, for example. If you do that, do yourself a flavor, favor and make it declarative, not imperative. Um, we, we did the arrow that we said like, okay, header, please update yourself. But this is, this is not like micro frontend shouldn't work. The micro frontends shouldn't know which other micro frontends are on that page because then again, you have this coupling and coupling means you have to talk to other people and 
I usually don't want to talk too much, so um, make it declarative. So just send out an event like um, something happened with the products and if you need this information, please use it. So the good part of the micro front end that is that you usually have happy developers because you have innovative teams and you can focus on your things and it's easy and it's your code base and you are basically in control. The bad part is um, are the beginners pitfalls. The challenge for us was we were one team and I know I talked a lot about the benefits of micro front ends until now, but imagine yourself now as a developer being in one team um, and your goal is to create something scalable where maybe teams from the whole planet in different time zones should work on. So the, this is complicated because you, you can just um, look to the next uh, person right next to you and discuss some things. And, and this is how code again gets coupled. So our challenge was to make something for now four teams. So in four months, we scale up from one team to four teams. And this is only possible if your code base also makes this possible. Um, so when I was in university, I was learning that dry is super important. So it was all about dry and kiss and these principles. And it was in my head and learn that. And of course, right now we do have, as I already mentioned, shared stuff, for example, the UI component library. And we do also have some, some, some shared JavaScript services like the routing helper or a tracking tool which implements Google Analytics. So we have a kind of abstraction there. But um, as I have to have learned over months, is um, how to share other things like testing setups. In the beginning, it made so much sense to share those things because we always used Vue, of course, we always used then Chest and um, Puppeteer or Cypress and we had the same Webpack configurations everywhere and we need the same vendors and helper functions because we were coming from one team and we, we all wrote the same style. But now we are like four teams and different styles are coming and TypeScript here and JavaScript there and Webpack changes over here and the ones wanted to use now other different, uh, different testing setup. And every time we wanted to change something that was shared, we had again talked to each other and this took a lot of time instead of just do it. Um, so my advice for everyone who wants to do micro front ends, don't share anything and this is important. This can take a lot of time if you share too much things. So you have to learn to let dry a bit go. Because this is in the end, this is it. If you are like a smaller teams, it's working. And this is also like the thing of having these verticals to not have this like 14 people and 91 lines of communication um, between each other. And if you have, again, shared things in the end, you will have to talk to all of them and you will have different opinions and it will take time. And what you want to be is fast and quick. But this was only, these were only the bad parts. So the parts you can, this organizational stuff. There were ugly parts. Ugly parts, we had memory leaks. I was used to write view applications, view single page applications, but I was not to have 20 micro front ends as view single page applications with server side rendering. Uh, so I was having like Grafana dashboards and looking for memory leaks when we, when we, when we, um, and then the server was crashing. So the ugly part of that was you don't have so many CSS and JavaScript bugs anymore because you have small code bases, but you have completely new kind of bugs. And if you're not used to them, you have to learn again how to fix them. We also had not isolated instances and we were super lucky that we uh, managed to saw that on staging and not on production because also because of the server side rendering, uh, we could like enter voucher codes, codes via a get parameter and um, we did some things with caching and Redis. So we had so many services in Kubernetes and Docker here and there. And um, so we by accident cached the voucher services of 
people and we just recognize it because we used in the testing different voucher codes and i was like hey, I, ne i never saw this voucher code before why is it happening at my place and we were like oh we should not deploy right now but other micro frontends could deploy it was just our micro frontend that was not deployable with a master um, configuration mistakes uh, my job as a front end uh, developer grew so i had to uh, write um, config maps for kubernetes and we had to see if the right app env was set and also there on staging by accident we were connected to the wrong database so the staging database from the one microservice was talking to the staging as to the developer database of another service and if this would have gone on production we couldn't have sold anything because yeah i mean you you would have talked to the developer database and then your order would never be there also namespaces uh up front, we had all of the micro frontends in like one namespace, writing stuff into the local storage or like using the event bus. We had these in the same repository and afterwards we split it up and have like now six repositories for um, all of these micro frontends. So if we want to use the same event names, we would have, have a problem. If we want to have the same name for one micro frontend, we would again have a problem because of service workers. So you have to think of all of these things up front. Do you need namespaces? Do you need prefixes and so on and so forth? Then again, if you're working in a team, just make some rules. They are not difficult. And in the end, it doesn't matter which decision you have just just make one decision how and where do we implement new features this was really important um for for project owners and uh, conceptors so if we want to have these voucher features on the landing page in the product detail page and also on the card and then in a checkout which team is doing this how is this working um a second question can we switch between different teams people are afraid of committing things and be in this one team sometime. Never once a team member really wanted to change, but we would have the opportunity. It's just, it's, it's of course it's possible if you don't want to be in the checkout, but you now want to play around on the landing page. And how can we guarantee overall good uh, UX and UI? Have a UI component library, have a good design system, and look at the page. It's the same answer as for monoliths look at the page and see how it's working out. Also one important thing, um, micro frontends won't, also verticals won't increase your user experience just by being there. You, what, you, what you increase is the developer experience and if developers are more happy, then you can increase user experience because you might be able to test your project better or you have the ideas because you focused on the project, then you have a better user experience. But don't try to tell your um, managers that you want to have micro fronts because they um, increase the user experience. This is per se not true. And yeah. This slide is because a lot of people ask me, yeah, but who is doing micro front ends? And usually I'm, I'm here at the point to tell you, you are not Facebook, you are not Airbnb, you might not be Spotify. So don't do things just because big companies are doing this. This slide should also only show you that there are companies out there who successfully use this micro front it's in production. So we have Spotify, Upwork, OpenTable, Zalando, we at Sinashwada, HelloFresh, also Klarna and Allegro for different parts of their application. Some of them using Mosaic 9, some of them um, iframes you also can connect the different styles of how you want to set up micro frontends you can use mosaic 9 and you can also use iframes it's it's of course it's possible if for any reasons you might need that um time is up before the q a at this time uh, i really wanted to thank um the amazing front conf team who made this possible in this short time um, all of my other conferences and meetups were cancelled and I think having even to work this out with now switching to Zoom, thank you for this and thank you for me as a speaker to make sure that I have everything I need.
So that's it about micro front ends and thanks a lot.